what I'm going to try to give to you today, and I'd like to maybe get a show of hands if I can uh, to find out where your background lies. So how many of you folks are just are personal trainers or work uh, sort of in a one-on-one -on -one or in a, as a strength coach? Okay, well, for those of you that are in real hardcore research, what I've done is sort of backed it out a little bit so that I could appeal to most of you out there, which is uh, trying to interpret the research that exists. So for those of you who want a little extra, uh, I'll be more than happy to hang around after we can talk and uh, so forth. Now I have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 72 slides or so. And I'm not going to be able to talk to you about every single one of them. On the back four or five slides are just uh, there's a reference sheet. And I've done a lot of the homework for you. found uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 70 articles or so that relate to the strength and conditioning, the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift specifically. And those are the ones I've listed at the back. So what I'm going to try to do is if I whip through a slide, don't panic. Of course, you guys are going to get the whole set of slides on your uh, CD. Um, so it, it just kind of to speed things up and give you the important information that exists out there. So, all right, so here's the lecture overview. And I decided also to just kind of stick my email address on there because uh, everybody always kind of wants to know a little extra information. So if there's anything you'd like uh, me to email to you, if you hit this email address right there, the sandlerd at fiu.edu, uh, I'll be able to jet you off any extra information that you may have. So the things we're going to talk about today, uh, real quickly I'll go over the lifts. Now I'm assuming that most of you have some good background in the lifts or at least are familiar with what a squat, what a bench, and what a deadlift is. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on those. Then uh, what I'm going to do is show you how to do a qualitative lift analysis and that is how do we look at what's going on and be able to make some um, inference from it so that we can help our athletes or our clients. I'm sure some of you work with uh, athletes and they're doing deep squats, big heavyweight squats, and some of you probably work with senior citizens. We actually do a lot of research with senior citizens, and their application of using these lifts are going to be slightly different. So I'm going to try to give you a way to look at the lifts. Then uh, what we're going to do is maybe take a quick look at the different lifting techniques and the different cross comparisons between bodybuilders, power lifters, and Olympic lifters. And again, we're staying particular with just the three lifts, the bench, the squat, and the deadlift. And then uh, what I'm going to do is do a, a little uh, style uh, comparison followed by a little bit of a segmental mechanical analysis and I will not get too deep into the physics. For those of you who don't have the biomechanics physics background, don't panic. Those of you who do, uh, we can hang out and talk, uh, you know, talk shop uh, all day long. And then uh, of course uh, I'm going to kind of show you some of the research that we're doing and how do we apply it to training. And that's the question I probably get asked more than anything uh, else is how do I get a big bench? And then the first question that uh, comes to mind is, well, what do you need a big bench for? Uh, I used to work with the athletes. I'm a former strength and conditioning coach at the University of Miami. Uh, we've had a uh, number of athletes that are in the uh, professional ranks right now at the, in the NFL and in the um, Major League Baseball. And every one of them always used to say, Coach, I want a bench like you. And of course, I would just say, hey, I wish I had the Jets like you did because I'll be playing uh, you know, in the NFL like you are. So there is a... Uh, you know, a way we need to look at these things to figure out what's going to be the most important for our athletes. Is a big bench or a big squat really going to help your performance out on the football field? And if so, how deep should I squat? Should I squat so I'm crushing soda cans with my butt? Like we always like to teach people to do. As a former power lifter, that's uh, the only acceptable way to squat in my mind. Um, but is that, necessarily, is that necessary for a football player, a baseball player, a tennis player, and so forth? So trying to understand some of the research that exists out there may help you coach your athletes, your clients, uh, and be able to do a much better job at looking at those things. So that's what I hope to be able to do in this hour and a half uh, time frame. All right, so quickly, the squat, the bench press, uh, and the deadlift, there's a whole bunch of uh, things to take a look at. And again, I'm just going to assume that you folks uh, know a little about, about this so I can head to the research. So these are some of the squat things we're going to look at. We're going to look at some of these bench uh, pieces of information here. And then as far as the deadlift goes, we're going to do the same kind of thing with the deadlift. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of data out on the deadlift. Nobody seems to want to do any research on the deadlift. There's some new stuff right now uh, that's just been published uh, in, the, in the latest 2002 uh, Medicine and Science Sports and Exercise journals. So unfortunately, I haven't been able to digest much of that for you yet. But uh, most of the data that exists out there is, is pretty lean. And so that's something we're going to be doing some research on. And I'll, and I'll show you some of the things that we're heading towards in our labs. 
All right, well, things we need to understand about force production. And again, those of you with a little bit of physiology background probably remember the pre-stretch and the stretch shortened cycle and those kind of things. So obviously, how much of a pre-stretch occurs is going to make a huge difference on the amount of weight we can lift. An interesting thing about the deadlift is it's probably the only exercise or one of the very few exercises that doesn't start with a pre-stretch. Your first portion of the lift is the concentric phase right from the ground up. So that's a whole different development of force than it is being able to lower the weight in, say, a bench press or lower the weight in a squat. So that's going to make a big difference, and you're going to see how much of a difference that makes uh, in terms of uh, some of the bench pressing data that I have to show you. Uh, then we got the segmental summation of force. Um, it's kind of amazing that our body moves in so many different ways, and if you talk to the bodybuilders, they're out there working each of their individual muscles for muscle quality. We as power lifters are interested in one thing only, and that is how much can we lift? And so what we have to do is, rather than concentrate on the different angles of my biceps and the different angles of how my quadriceps might get affected to work on the sweep and work on the teardrop and those kind of things, what I'm more concerned with is, hey, what's the best way to get this weight from point A to point B? And so we can do that by analyzing segments, and we make a few assumptions when we do that, and I'll share those with you as well. Uh, interesting thing that happens in all lifts and, uh, and I'm going to talk about this uh, quite a bit, and I'll show it to you in the research, is that in all lifts that we do, regardless of whether it's a, a bicep curl or a squat or a bench press, we always have two applications of force. We have a first and a second drive. And the reason that occurs is because our body goes through a mechanical set of uh, levers uh, that goes through a range of motion. And as we go through the range of motion, our levers work uh, together with each other, and of course we have muscles that are going to compete against each other. When that happens, that forces us to, we have an area where we actually have a, a uh, disadvantage uh, of leverage. And we'll talk about that quite a bit, and I'm sure every person in this room has experienced it, the, uh, the dreaded sticking point. And uh, I have questions, not a day goes by that I don't get the, how do I get through the sticking point? Like there's a magical exercise, that one exercise that is going to propel me through the sticking point. In actual fact, that's not the case. We, everybody has a sticking point, you always will. And so what I'm going to try to show you is a little bit about why that occurs. And so you'll see we've get a, we get a first and a second drive. Things to look at then when we do an analysis is the bar path and the center of mass, both the center of mass of your, yourself and of the weight. In the case of the bench press, we don't have to worry about our center of mass. We just have to worry about the weight of the barbell. So we're concerned about where the barbell position is. But in the squat and the deadlift, remember, uh, especially in the squat, not only am I lowering the weight, I'm also lowering my body weight and my mechanics and the way in which I lift it is going to change the dynamics of the entire lift. And so it is very important that technique is used when we're doing these lifts. So I'm going to kind of show you is compare some of the different styles that you see that a power lifter does versus an Olympic lifter or bodybuilder. So real quickly, a qualitative analysis is just simply an easy way to, for what coaches do. And every one of you have done this, I can guarantee it, especially those that are your personal training. You're all qualitative and analyzers. Because every time your client goes to do a lift and you correct your client's technique, you've now, in your mind, done a quick qualitative analysis of what's going on. We take that one step further as biomechanists, and we go in and try to put numbers on it and give it what's called the quantitative analysis. But in actual fact, the coaching, the qualitative analysis, is probably the most important tool that you can take from, uh, you know, from what I'm going to lecture at it. And that is, is how do I actually use this to help somebody lift better. So these are just a few technique things that we need to look at, our uh, analysis of which muscles are involved, the mechanical analysis, and again, back to the bar position, and issues such as timing and so forth. And again, that's going to be radically different than the idea of lifting to build bigger biceps. Because again, as power lifters, and looking at the bench to squat and the deadlift in that sense, our concern is just to lift a huge amount of weight, and really not what our biceps and uh, so forth look like. Not that that's not a bad thing, of course. So some coaching things. Of course, these are just some quick coaching tidbits. And again, uh, I'm not going to spend uh, uh, time on that, but uh, you guys all digest information and uh, send it back out to the client using some of these techniques here. So here's what I'm going to look at. I'm going to look at uh, bench, uh, bodybuilders, powerlifters, and weightlifters real quick, and then the don't know how to lifters. So the bodybuilders, of course, uh, they're looking for the muscle quality. That's what their interest is. 
And so when they do things like the squat and the bench press, they're looking at it specifically for development of some aspect of musculature. The, uh, the Olympic lifters are now looking at trying to get a weight above their head, which requires an explosive amount of force, and of course a body position adjustment to match that. So it's very speed oriented. So while they'll do deep squats uh, for their front squat, their, their uh, performance of the squat is going to be radically different than a power lifter in that they're going to be doing the squats for a portion of their Olympic lift, like the clean and jerk. And then, of course, they may or may not bench. Um, and then deadlifts are going to be converted versions of the deadlift to help do the power clean and the snatch movements. So they're going to have a uh, considerably different uh, way of looking at things. The power lifters, back to us again. We talk about ultimate force generation, bar path position, and so forth. Um, and of course, one of the interesting things I found in the research is when we start looking at uh, the, the length and the size of various people, if you notice when you look around here, you'll see a whole pile of power lifters that are here. Uh, some of my mentors are actually here. The people who taught me how to power lift uh, are here. And of course, if you look at power lifters, they're, for the most part, we're not the tallest folks on the planet. Um, and probably that has a lot to do with our uh, ability to lift uh, some large quantities of weight. And you'll find like things with like the bench press, for example, a very, very tall lifter is limited by the distance their hands can go based on the IPF rules, which is 81 centimeters between four fingers. So that is going to automatically put them in a different position than someone like myself who can take advantage of the full 81 centimeter uh, arm width. And then real quickly, the don't know uh, how to lifters, don't know why I'm doing this, don't know who I learned this from, don't know how to squat, don't know how to bench, don't know how to deadlift, and of course, uh, throw on a couple extra plates because the chick is walking by. <laughs> Hopefully we can try to limit some of that by what we have here uh, today. So as far as the squatting styles go, you're all familiar probably with the different squatting styles, so I'll address them when we get to the actual research. As far as the benching styles, the same thing, I'll address them when we get to the research. And then the deadlifting styles as well, we'll, we'll see those as we get to the research. So the first real important concept I want to talk about is this thing called the bimodal curve. And all that simply means, for those of you who are not really graphically inclined, is that when we look at a lift by its force and its velocity, the speed and the amount of, uh, of, uh, power, of uh, force we actually apply, amount of strength we're using, we notice that there are two peaks in the curve. And in between the two peaks is this little valley. And what that simply means is that we are actually having that first and that second drive that I spoke about. The amount of force production in the beginning of a lift is great. The amount of force production at the end of a lift is great. Somewhere in the middle, not a huge amount of force production, not a huge amount of velocity. And that's probably that area that we call the sticking region. So we've seen this research come out back in, the, in 77 and 78. Again, uh, it was visited in 1985. Uh, in 2000, in Escamilla's uh, study, we even saw it in the deadlift as well. And then that kind of started making us believe, and this was actually well before Escamilla's work, we started realizing that, hey, all lifts seem to show this bimodal curve, whether it's, a, like I said, an arm curl or a bench press or a squat. That means inherently we are going to have some issues that we're not going to be able to, to manage or we're going to have to figure out a better way to manage it. And that's very important in this fact that there always will be a sticking point. There will always be two drive portions. And the way in which we perform the lift may or may not be able to help us drive through the sticking region, as I'll show you, and also uh, has parameters in terms of where the force generation occurs, which is, of course, very important for maybe figuring out athletic performance. Now, I like bringing it back to that squat, because as a strength coach, and uh, I had my athletes always just intuitively, I just said, you know, right to the ground. Every single one of them had the perfect squat technique all the way to the ground, every time with their butt, you know, touching the ground kind of thing. And now I'm thinking to myself, when in sport do we ever get in that kind of position? Maybe a, maybe a catcher on a baseball team is down in that kind of position and needs to be able to explode out of the bottom to uh, throw out a man at second, you know, running into second. But other than that, I don't see too many sports where this uh, deep squat is necessary. Yet as a power lifter, of course, if you don't deep squat, you're not squatting at all, as far as I'm concerned. So, what we have to do is come up with a way to do this. If I look at an offensive lineman, you look at the body position of many of the offensive linemen, most of their driving is coming from this position here. But how many in this room, when, if you saw someone in the gym squatting just like that, well, most of us, of course, would be talking in the background about the quarter squats that this person's doing. So 
Maybe, though, those quarter squats is, is very applicable to sport. I'm sure the people in the weight rooms that are doing it still don't really uh, know why they're doing it, but this is what we're going to try to find in our research that we're doing now. Because the research that exists uh, out there hasn't really been touched in several years. If you notice, most of my studies are back in the 70s and the 80s, a little bit of work in the early 90s, and then there's been this gap where nobody's done anything until very recently where uh, Escamilla's group and uh, Newton's group and so forth have a little bit of information that exists out there. So we're starting to come back into it. So this is what we're going to take a look at in the squat. Here's the first graph. Now, for those of you who don't like graphs, don't panic. All a graph is is a picture, and a picture tells a story. So now what I'm going to do is tell you a little story. And that is that this graph here just simply shows a typical force and a typical velocity output when we look at uh, the lift that goes on. And we're really fortunate because up across the top there, we got this actual stick figure person that kind of shows you where you are in the uh, movement. This line here defines that bottom phase or the, uh, the bottom out por portion of a squat. The first portion of a squat, we notice that as, the, as we descend, the bar velocity, the vertical velocity is going to drop like a rock, right? The first thing we do is we drop down real quick. And then, of course, we use this amount of force here to recover from the dropping effort so that we can stop the bar at the bottom. In actual fact, when we go to drop down on our squat, we actually leave the bar and we're dropping before the bar is, and the bar is trying to catch up to me. The bottom, I then hit the brakes on there, start some vertical force to stop the bar from going any further down, trap it at the bottom, and now I'm down at the bottom of my lift, and it takes me this long to actually recover before I can start my upward motion. Now, the interesting thing about this is the solid line is a competitive lifter, someone with experience. The dotted line is the novice lifter. And unfortunately, this graph doesn't really break down and show you how much of a difference exists here. However, if you look at the um, inexperienced lifter, the inexperienced lifter seems to get much more greater vertical velocity, so drops much quicker. When, the, when that happens, it takes a lot more force to control the bar than the experienced lifter. And so what we found here is that a, uh, the rate at which you drop, if you drop the bar down too fast, it's going to take you too long to recover at the bottom. You take too long to recover at the bottom, you're not going to have enough force and develop that pre-stretch that we're all aware of at a very uh, good rate. So one of the things we find is that this rate of descent should be a lot more controlled than most people do in the weight room. And you can see it, a competitive lifter controls it. This distance here is quite a bit. 0.8 meters uh, feet per second is a huge speed difference. It really is. It doesn't maybe show it on the graph, but that's a very large speed difference. So when I drop down too quickly, I now have too much work to do to control it. When that happens, I'm investing all of my strength now and all this elastic stretch in trying to hold the bar before I can actually give that huge force output to start it. And it was very interesting to see that the force output here was almost identical. The, uh, the ver vertical bar velocity was almost identical between the experienced and the non-experienced lifter at the first drive, which is suggestive that all this time here was taken to try to recover. And all that time taken to recover means that I, don't have, to, I have to work much harder to uh, actually get the force. So in actual fact, we're starting to produce, if I'm an inexperienced lifter, I'm starting to produce this force all the way down here to get that big drive up there. So in the experienced lifter now gets a less, uh, less time spent down low, gives uh, less speed dropping down, so has more recovery time to give that first force. And the second thing we found is that their dip point now, and hence their second drive, their dip point doesn't drop down quite as far because now that invested time that was spent here is utilized more uh, efficiently by giving that explosive drive up. So what we, the, the, the thing to take away from this then is to say, hey, look, let's not drop down so fast. Let's control that descent. Let's maybe give it that momentary pause at the bottom and get our composure before we drive it back up. And let's not try to rebound that thing too much. We'll talk about that a little more as we see some other stuff. So uh, the int uh, real quickly then, McLaughlin's group in 77 showed that there's a sticking point uh, and also found some information about the greater ho horizontal hip and knee displacement in less skilled lifters. Less skilled lifters did a lot more of this kind of activity than the more skilled lifters. So when you see the LSL, that means less skilled lifters. The less skilled lifters did a lot more of this kind of activity. And, that, and you can see when we take a look at lifting, you look at a, a very advanced squatter, the bar will travel literally straight up and down, and that's a coaching tip we look for. 
Well, if I start out my squat with my knees, sorry, blinding somebody there. If I start out my squat with my knees, now the bar is going to take this radical Z kind of configuration, and that's going to be very inefficient in producing force. So just by watching the bar, and this is easy for us to do, just stand on side of the lifter and watch the bar go up and down. You can get a lot of your information there in terms of that qualitative coaching. So the bar velocity was greater. We spoke about that. And of course, the bar velocity is similar at initial drive. But due to this, this uh, descent velocity, that's where it seems to be a controlling factor between the uh, novice and the more experienced lifters. Also, uh, Fry's group found that uh, a slight outward uh, foot angle is also very important. I think, and this is kind of neat here, and we'll come back to this in a second. But it says that an upright posture is preferred. However, the forward lean is necessary. So how do we do all that? How do we get an upright posture but a forward lean? And if you'll notice, some of the power lifters get in these really tight forward leans. You're saying to yourself, God, that can't be good. In actual fact, it seems to be quite good. The mechanics that we use adjust for it. And I'll show you some really interesting stuff about, uh, about tendon strength and uh, patellar compressive forces that seem to be that issue of why we should never squat deep. We always talk about the damage on the knees and so forth. I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, information that says otherwise. Interesting thing, power lifters use far more hip than knee force. And uh, non-power uh, non lifters tend to use a lot more knee force, which means a power lifter's first thing to do, we talk about hip drive. Hip drive is also way more sport specific, as we all probably are familiar with. One of the reasons we do the power clean is to develop that explosive hip drive. We see that power lifters use a lot more hip in their squat than novice lifters do. Due to that uh, thing, the reason why part of that happens is there's got to be a greater trunk and uh, lean to do that. Because to get your hips really involved, you've got to get your hips in the right position. To get your hips in the right position, you have to have the right amount of lean so I can get the right kind of depth when I do my squat. So we find that although there's a greater lean, we've got a lot more hip involvement. And we're going to see how that hip involvement is going to take the stress off uh, some of the knee uh, in the long run. So the neat thing we find is that the low bar squats seem to uh, allow more hamstring work, and that seems to decrease all of our shear mechanics on the knee. So in a more upright squat, in a stance where I'm doing more knee type of work, I've also got a lot more shearing forces on the knee and compression on the patella, whereas when I have this bent over position, what I'm doing is moving my center of mass directly underneath the bar and therefore taking some of the stress off the knee. So your initial thought is, well, it's going to just put too much pressure on the back. In actual fact, it's not, because the mechanics that I've now uh, created, you're going to see, are going to put actually send the forces down your bones, down your tibia. And of course, you have tons of strength down, uh, compressive strength down the actual bone. Uh, bone is very, very uh, resistant to straight on compression. So uh, we also find, again, that the, the hamstrings then get involved. And this is an, an interesting thing that when I get down in this deep squat, I'm now taking advantage of the hamstrings being active on the hips as a hip extensor. Remember, you're going to find out about the hamstrings. We're going to talk about the biarticular muscles. Hamstrings cross both the knee and the hip. We have to figure out a way to get them most involved in the lift, and power lifters tend to do that because of their body position. They'll end up utilizing the hamstring against the, uh, on the hip rather than on the knee, and that pulling force that would be normally against the knee is now going to reduce the shear forces on it. So by modifying your body position into this wider stance, slightly pointed out toe position, and more hip activity, you're actually taking a huge amount of stress off the knees. That's a good thing. Not to mention the fact that we got a heck of a lot more power here than we do down here. So this is a much better lever system for us. All right. So here's our, our two joint muscles. And the term biarticular just simply means spans two joints. And you know that uh, all three of our hamstring muscles, they're going to span the hip and the knee. Our gastroc, and we're going to come look at this in the deadlift, the gastrocnemius is going to work on both the knee as a knee flexor as well as on the uh, ankle as a plantar flexor. So you're going to see something very interesting in deadlifting. I found quite uh, interesting that uh, the plantar flexion force in certain styles of deadlifting are going to be reduced to allow the gastroc to um, work effectively in the knee complex. And I'll talk about that when we get there. Then, of course, our quadriceps groups, the rectus femoris 
is a two joint muscle, but the other three are not. The other three just work on the uh, knee. What you're going to find is that the rectus femoris activity during a squat is going to be reduced quite a bit because, of course, if it wasn't, then it would have too much of a hip flexor effect, not allow the glutes and the hamstrings to do their work back there. So understanding the two joint muscles means a lot to us because now we realize that we were going to have to examine the form and the technique and find out what are some of the reasons why we're not able to get deep and not able to produce that kind of explosive power. Uh, this just shows you how we do it, and I won't spend any time on that, uh, but it's pretty, it's pretty uh, detailed. We spend a lot of time just kind of looking at each joint, doing all this mathematics. Fortunately, nowadays, we have computers that can help us. Uh, unfortunately, though, when you take class, you have to do it the long way uh, because your professors will not let you use the computers to do it. So let's see, McLaughlin in 78, trunk extensors produce more torque than the thigh and, and the lower leg. So that's good. Again, more hip. More hip activity is going to be involved in a squat with an advanced lifter. Uh, then the trunk lean is going to affect the torque distribution inversely. That's a good thing. The greater the lean, the less torque produced about the knee. So now the more I lean at the, lower, uh, at the trunk, the less forces I'm going to have on the knee. That's another good thing if I'm concerned about knee mechanics. Highly skilled lifters maintain the more erect trunk position causing thigh extensor dominant. Wait a second. I just went forward and told you that the power lifters exert a more leaned over position, and that's the truth. When you look at research, there is a lot of paradoxes that exist out there. The problem is, is that in some cases, we're looking at lifters that are more erect and lifters that are not. When I went back and examined the research, I realized that some of the lifters that were used were Olympic lifters. Well, if I use an Olympic lifter, an Olympic lifter is going to exhibit a more upright position the front squat position, the back squat position, the knee bend position, and that's going to be more specific to lifting a load over top of your head. And so the research, you've got to be real careful when you read a journal article that's suggestive of something that you can generalize it to your, uh, to your people that you're working with. So we've got to be careful. I don't try to do too many generalizations. People ask me all the time, what do you think about this article? And uh, I just give them a little overview of what I read and interpret from the article, but much more than that, I can't generalize on a group of football players from one article that was done. In fact, when, we, uh, when you talk to strength coaches, as a strength coach, I did what I needed to do with my athletes, which might be very, very different than, uh, uh, say, Mark Philippi, who works with uh, UNLV. There's uh, just a different group of athletes, even though it's the same sports that we play. It's a different application. His weight room is designed differently, so there's a lot of things to think about. So when you're looking at articles and you're looking at things, take everything with an open mind. And again, same with what I'm telling you here today. This is my interpretation of the stuff that exists out there, and I'm just one person giving you some feedback on all the things that exist. And, and again, one of the fortunate things about a conference is you've got a heck of a lot of knowledge here in this. Uh, you've got a heck of a lot of knowledge sitting in this room alone, let alone the other uh, four rooms that exist. So uh, utilize the people that are here and talk to them about the things that they do. This just quickly shows you, hey, pretty cool. That's your uh, trunk, the trunk extensors. These are your thigh extensors. And these are your ankle plantar flexors. Interesting thing, as you start going up in the squat, your plantar flexors, which you would think would do a lot of work, right? You'd figure that, that the, uh, the plantar flexor to push down into the ground would be pretty active. In actual fact, it can't be too, too active, because if the plantar flexion gets too active, it's not going to allow your knee to extend. Go back to that biarticular joint activity. So what happens during this portion here is to get good knee extension, the plantar flexors actually don't do too much work. I know this looks negative, but that's because it's uh, looking at the flexor uh, activity. So in the actual push-off, what we end up getting is a huge amount of hip, not too much knee because the same thing. If I get too much of my knee extensors, I can't take the, let the hamstrings get involved in hip extension and, of course, the hamstrings are going to uh, uh, contribute to the knee shear force. Um, so the best way to get this to do is allow the hamstrings up here. So the initial drive then becomes a big hip explosion, uh, followed then by towards the end of the lift by what we call a knee explosion. Okay, and that's how our force is typically developed in a squat. Big hip drive, and if you ask the squatters that are in here, they'll probably tell you the same thing. That's how I learned it. Explode out of the hole. Even if the weight's, you know, however much it is, I know some guys in here can can uh, lift a whole pile. Uh, even when you have a huge amount of weight, your mentality is explode out of the hole and drive with the hips. 
everything's hip action, driving right up. I'm sure if you go next door and see uh, Dr. Hartle's work, uh, he'll probably be doing that right now, telling you, drive it up with the hips. This, this shows us certainly that that has to happen if we want to get the bar really traveling. I wish I knew all this stuff back when I was powerlifting, too. I might have uh, actually done a little better in the squat. Um, these guys just kind of showed a few uh, general things, and it's very interesting that all these muscles are going to work together um, to help balance and right you and keep you in proper position. As I go through a range of motion, the thing that prevents me from falling over, falling backwards, falling sideways, is all those other muscles that we never talk about that are working really hard to keep me stabilized. And this just kind of suggests, hey, sometimes these other muscles are going to just fire up, and we typically see the opposing muscle groups firing back and forth with one another. In the bench press, for example, we see bicep activity. So they're firing back and forth with one another to help maintain the position that we want the bar to travel in. And again, every time that happens, that takes away from force production the way we want. So if we actually learn how to control the lift and get our body to move in the right position around the lift, we're going to be able to summarize our forces into a more um, uh, efficient lift in general. This was kind of really neat, and I, and I won't spend too much time. I don't, these are big numbers, and I don't know if any of you uh, know so much about the numbers. But the short, simple por portion of this slide just says, hey, guess what? No matter how much weight you squat, no matter how much weight you deadlift, you are never going to produce enough shear force on the joints or the muscles to tear tendons and, uh, and destroy your patella. So all those folks out there that are telling you, don't squat deep because it's hard on the knees, no, the problem is that we're not squatting properly. Because if we're squatting properly, there is no way, in, no way possible that I'm going to produce 15,000 newtons of force to tear my, patella, uh, to tear my uh, quadricep tendon off my patella. It's just not happening. There's no way. Not even in a 1,000-pound squat, it's not going to happen. It's not going to get close to that. So these guys can hang on to a heck of a lot more work um, than we're really thinking of. In fact, when we look at the research, you can take a big squat, 800-pound squat, and have less sheer force on the knee than a tennis player running across the court to dive for a shot and reach out, jam down like that, and take a shot. And now people are telling us, don't squat too deep because it's going to put pressure on your knee, yet go and run around on a tennis court all day long and see if that doesn't do any damage. So what do you think my tennis players are doing when I'm working with them? They're doing deep squats, they're doing lunges, they're doing all this stuff that's going to get them ready for the type of pressures that they're going to see on a court. And that's important to think about. This just says, you know, some more technical stuff in there. Um, but it's neat because, you know, here's 8,000 newtons of force generated by the quadriceps. Our strain rate is probably somewhere. And if you look at a, a power lifter, because a power lifter has progressed, these numbers are probably even much greater than they're showing here. Okay, because this, they just take wet muscle and they uh, hang it. And they just hang a bunch of weight from it and see what happens, see when it rips. So, and the chances are they haven't been taking them out of... Uh, um, you know, Ed Cohen's leg, I don't think he was, uh, didn't, you know, wanted to give his quadricep up to science. I don't know if he's in here or not. But, so, there's a good chance that he, he can withstand way, way, way more than what we're looking at here. And that's an important thing to think about. Proper progression, there is no way any of the lifts I do are going to be dangerous if I progress properly. And that's the truth also with the Olympic lifts as well. Most of the stuff that's out there, just people just don't know how to lift properly. This just tells you about the patella, same kind of thing, so I you know, briefly spoke about that. Here's an interesting thing. Here's the difference between a power lifter. This is a power lifter, okay, and that's the power lifter hip act activity. This is the power lifter's knee activity. So the black box lines, if you follow them through, are the power lifter's hip and knee activities. If you notice, a power lifter, huge amount of hip, not too much knee in comparison to one another. The person in the middle is an Olympic lifter. The Olympic lifter is much more matched with their, their hip and their knee. And that probably is going to have a lot to do with the body position that you have to get in to have a weight sitting out in front of you versus on your back. And while this may not seem like that much of a difference, there's a heck of a difference there. And that can create an awful lot of uh, uh, shear in terms of where my center line is. And also, probably a lot of it has to do with the way in which the lift has to be uh, executed. Power lifter, again. There's no rule saying how fast I lift it as long as I lift it clean. Whereas in Olympic lifting, if I don't lift it fast, I'm not going to be able to get underneath the bar to allow for the completion of the lift. So this just illustrates real quickly that, 
hip drive versus knee drive is much greater than a power lifter versus an Olympic lifter. Again, what do I need for my sport? What do I need for my client? Do I lift faster? Do I use front or back squat? Where do I put the stance? How do I put my position in so that I can get the maximum amount of force production? This is some of our data from our lab, and I know it's, oh, really looks uh, hard to see. Um, and yeah, right now it's just some, uh, just very, very initial data. I was kind of hoping by the time we got here that I had some really cool stuff to show you. Unfortunately, uh, when we do, when we work with lifters and we try to do this stuff, uh, it just takes an awful lot of time to look through data, and a lot of our data, to be honest with you, didn't come out quite the way we wanted to. Uh, so this is just a quick showing of what kind of happens when you do a lift, and, and I chose this lift specifically. I got a couple other ones in here, because as you notice here in these peak forces, that's a three rep set. The peak force is dropped considerably by the third rep. This rep was executed explosively, and if you look at the second drive, so this was a relatively light weight. If you look at the second drive, it's very, very small. When we explode out of the bottom, our first drive is huge, our sticking point is very small, our second drive is pretty much non-existent. But now watch what happens as I do three explosive reps. All of a sudden, force output is lower, sticking point is longer, second drive is greater. And furthermore, third rep, and this is only three reps at a relatively light weight. Third uh, rep is less force output again than those two, much longer sticking point again, and a much greater contribution from the second drive. So if I'm looking at explosive lifting now, I also have to realize that the fatigue is going to get in the way. Same with any lifting. You notice how your reps you know, slowly start to look worse as you go through. At what point do you stop the reps and take a break? And what is your goal? How many reps should you be doing? And again, that's going to be very important in terms of the type of exercise prescription we do. I think this is a pretty fascinating slide for that. Now, I wish I could give you the real information statistically, but we're still now looking at all the other lifters that we've, we've looked at. We've, uh, our study had like 12 lifters with varying backgrounds. Uh, nobody really huge, um, but uh, we just, we, you know, everybody was pretty uh, similar in terms of their max lifts, somewhere between a 400 and a, and a 600 pound squat. Those were the guys that we worked with. They were all you know, close, pretty close to competition depth. So it should be pretty interesting to see what the rest of our data shows. Yeah? What lift is this? This is the squat. Thank you. Yep. This is the squat. We just have, uh, what is this is showing you is just a ground reaction force from just a straight scale, uh, just a, a Y or Z component uh, ground reaction force um, plate. And we just summarized two legs together to, to find the information out. But again, I haven't uh, digested. The, uh, the material. I'm not about to say that this is existent for every single person. I'm nowhere near that point, but I, I think everybody can kind of see this trend that is starting to take place. Now, then what we did is kind of took some heavier lifts and noticed that we didn't get the same clean type of activity that some of the other people did. But if you take a look, and again, the timing scales are a little bit different, and so are these scales here, but I just want you to see the general trends that are going on. As the lift gets heavier, all of a sudden, the double peak, the amount of time in sticking point, the rate of drop between the amount of peak force and uh, the bottom force in the lift, this would be where the lift ended, where the first rep ended. As you see that, this is a pretty large change in terms of the amount of force produced and what happens when we get to the sticking point. As the weight gets heavier, there's a more pronounced sticking point. That should answer an awful lot of questions to people. Why do I have so much trouble when the weight gets heavier? Well, you have to change your mechanics to match it, and I'll show you how that's done in the bench press. And again, you can just kind of see here again, here's another force output, a little bit longer, not quite as uh, much. Again, you see the fatigue pattern starting to set in, much longer sticking point, and even a double, triple hump, if you will, on uh, that second force application. So again, this is just kind of showing as we start increasing the weight, um, what happens. And then we get a couple of ones that just come out pretty erratic, and it's kind of hard to see what's going on with these. We actually also had people practicing jumping off the uh, plate. So when we did our research, uh, what we looked at was uh, the difference between squatting 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90 percent of your one repetition maximum. And right now we're showing, of course, like everybody shows, that, that normal power curve where the best rate to produce power is somewhere between 40 and 50, 60 percent of your one RM. So we're showing that kind of stuff, but we're also finding some very interesting things out about force production. Force, and if, those of you who understand the power curve, which is the force-velocity curve, 
The force times velocity gives you how much power you produce. In the lower squats, the lighter weight travels much faster in any movement. Right? Bar travels so much faster, so we get a, a relatively high power output. But when we got the really heavy weight, the bar travels very slowly. The velocity component is not enough to give us a high power output. So what we're finding is that it's very interesting. Between that 40, 50, 60, 70 percent range, we're also finding that no matter how much weight we put on, the force contribution doesn't change that much. It's all velocity relative. When we just ask someone to squat with, a, with weight. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing because we talk about explosive lifting. And this gives us now some insight into what we need to do to get a truly good explosive lift. So here's my gems for, for squatting. Uh, wasted horizontal knee and hip displacement coupled with an increased low back angle reduced the contribution of the hips during the ascent. So we, we quickly spoke about that. Hey, guess what? If we get ourselves into a nice position and minimize this type of activity here, the swaying activity, we're probably going to have a much better squat. Slower descent allows for more control, reduces the counter effect of the initial drive, and of course allows us to produce greater velocity through the sticking region. And that's the whole key about getting through the sticking region. The only way to really get through the sticking region is to accelerate through it with enough force at the bottom of your lift to drive through the sticking region because it's going to occur anyways. So what we need to do is figure out the optimal way to get that force at the bottom uh, high enough and fast enough to move through the sticking rate region. And of course, as the weights increase, the velocity is going to be pretty hard to, to get it uh, really moving. You've all done those big benches and squats where things go very, very slowly. So we modify our position. It's really easy to see in some of the bench press research, not so easy to see in some of the squat uh, research, and nothing exists yet on the deadlift research that I was able to find. Bar position on the body affects joint loads as well as efficiency and total force production. Higher up versus lower down, we hear about higher up on the bar is supposed to do more quadricep work. Lower down is supposed to be more hip work. In actual fact, I'm not so sure the reasoning for that is just that straightforward. I have a tendency to believe that the higher up we put the bar, the more we tend to hunch over. The more we tend to get rounded and hunched over, the less we'll be able to utilize the hips because we won't be able to put them where we want to. If I get too hunched over like this, I now can't get my hips in the position that I need to lift the weight, so I can't get myself in this p desired position that I have here. Secondly, also we find that, uh, and this is just some anecdotal evidence uh, that I've just seen in, in what's going on, and of course I'm not out here trying to make any bold statements. However, uh, that arm grip placement is going to make a difference as well. When you get your hands out this wide, that again has this tendency to cause you to slouch. And when I'm slouched, I'm now not getting into my position again. So one of the techniques we use in powerlifting is tell the people to get their arms in tight and close. That now gives me my chest up position, forces my body to get into the right kind of position to give me better mechanics to do this lift. And then, of course, I, get to hear, I hear it from my athletic trainers. Well, that's going to put all this stress on the shoulder capsule. And I take a look, and I just see those pictures of a football quarterback throwing a ball with a defense alignment in his face, ripping his arm backwards after the shot. And I think to myself, God, that's got to be more punishing on the shoulder than holding your arms like this on a bar. An actual fact we find, again, now, if somebody has a shoulder problem, then of course I'm not going to get their arms in close. But I am going to have to work much harder at keeping their technique in the right position. So those are our general teaching gems for squatting. As far as the bench press then goes, the, uh, the research that exists out there is a little bit more because, of course, everybody benches. I'm sure everybody in this room benches, and I would bet that everybody in this room benches on Monday, right? Monday is International Bench Press Day. Everybody's aware that Monday is International Bench Press Day. People will sit around the gym and just wait for a bench press to come free, sit there for an hour or two, just sitting on the bench. Can I jump in with you? You know, one of these kind of things, because nobody would ever do anything before bench pressing. No way you would hit the pec deck before you hit the bench press, because then I wouldn't be able to lift as much, and then I won't look good when I'm flopping around on the bench uh, like a fish out of water anyway. So, the, the research is a lot more because everybody benches. Of course, the research still doesn't help us do an awful lot. My colleagues back in these days, and of course, 96 is a relatively new study, but these guys back in 77, 78, and early 80s did some great foundational work. It's absolutely outstanding work that they did to begin with. The problem is, is they never took it that extra step forward, which is now what we are trying to do in my lab, and as well, other people are trying to do around the country, and that is, what does all this mean once again? 
Because again, having a big bench is not the key to success in all cases. Helps you in a powerlifting competition, but maybe not in sport. Brentenberg and his group uh, found that uh, obviously this is just very, very straightforward information that we all probably know. Hey, guess what? It's not just the pecs, the anterior deltoids, and the triceps that are involved in the bench press. Yes, those are the big three. There's a lot of other muscles that are playing a role. All those rotator cuff muscles, uh, other elbow, uh, the elbow flexors, your biceps group actually gets involved in the bench press in terms of riding the bar, the grip strength, all that kind of stuff. And if you ask a competitive bencher, what do you do with your legs? You drive them into the ground and use them to drive, your, drive the bar up as well. What do you do with your body position? You drive it into the back of the bench to maintain a tight body position to get the weight going up. So in actual fact, there's probably a whole pile of things that are going on. Now McLaughlin's group uh, has found that, it, uh, that a lot of the variations and so forth, again, produced this same uh, um, unweighting period and the same sticking region. So that's all I'm kind of showing you here is that, uh, again, we have this uh, sticking region. So this is a typical bench press curve then. Hey, guess what? It looks very similar to a squat curve. Huge force application. This normalized line here is the bar weight, the normalized bar weight. This kind of shows you how we get these terms that you hear used in bench pressing, which is the uh, initial, and again, this is right off the drive from the chest. Okay, so this here starts the drive from the chest. There's no eccentric portion of this lift on this chart. Our first drive is huge. Huge amount of force, boom, hard velocity, drive it off our chest. We got that sticking point again. Notice the bar's force is actually less than the initial weight of the bar. What happens is I've driven it so hard that the bar, in a sense, comes off my hands. As it's coming off my hands, it starts to slow down considerably because now it's got no more force pushing against it. I know it's hard for you to imagine that a weight, you know, three, four, five hundred pounds actually comes out of somebody's hands, uh, but in a sense it does. And what happens during that time is the bar then begins to slow down considerably. Hopefully, though, before the bar completely slows down, I've either A, given enough force, or B, can catch up to it enough and give enough force in my second application of force, which is what we pretty much call that elbow drive. And then, of course, the lockout which is once I've locked it out, now I've literally launched the bar right off my hands as I've kind of snapped my elbows together. And that's how this uh, uh, bench press uh, curve seems to work. So, some interesting things we found. Stuff like the shoulder torque was much greater in larger lifters. And again, I think that, uh, and when I talk about torque, we talk about that, that uh, force times that vertical or horizontal distance away from the actual act line of action that's trying to occur. So what we find with the larger lifters is their bar is going to touch in a little bit different position. And the reason that happens is that, again, they are controlled by the 81 centimeter rule. A larger lifter is not able to get their hands out as wide as we would like them to be able to get. So because of that, they're now seeing that they're going to have this greater torque. It's going to force them to touch the bar down lower on the chest. Kind of like how you and I, those of you who are shorter like me, when we go to go to a, a close grip bench, what happens and where does the bar go? In a wide grip bench, I'm probably touching across my nipple line or somewhere up in this pec region here. When I go to a close grip bench, I'm starting to touch a little bit lower down on the sternum. I have to make that modification because of the way the actual muscles work in conjunction with one another. So uh, again, that's what I kind of suggest there. And then um, we found that the larger lifters generated more power by the velocity component, not because of the increased load either. So in other words, bigger lifters, the people that lifted more weight, had, uh, had more power, but it wasn't just because of the bigger load. Once we normalized the loads, and of course not me, but the research, once it normalized the loads to all the lifters, they found that the power output was still much greater in the advanced lifter. And when we think power output, we always think of explosive, and when you think about power lifting, we know that the bar never travels that explosively. But again, the fact that we are exploding up, and we get that huge acceleration portion in the middle, in the, be in the beginning, which I showed you on that first uh, curve is indicative of the fact that we're producing much greater power at the area where we need to. Want to get a bigger bench? You need to get more explosive off the chest. So we need to come up with ways to get more explosive off the uh, chest. Uh, this was kind of interesting. Although the graphs didn't kind of reveal it that I looked at, um, there was a longer force application by experienced lifters as well. So what we found is they're more explosive than a longer force application. Um, all right. So this, this kind of shows you what's going on here. And again, 
just tells you a little story. This is the shoulder position. This is a distance away from the shoulder. The light lifter produced a distance that was much closer to the shoulder than the novice and the heavy expert. But you're saying, well, God, how come the heavy expert and the novice are, have about the same shoulder distance? And again, that goes to the fact that the taller, heavier athlete, I mean, you get a 300-pounder, it's a good chance the 300-pounder is about 6'2 or 6'3 versus our light experts, which probably are somewhere in the 5'2, 5'3, 5'5 range. Uh, and that is, of course, going to be affected by their grip uh, mandate, meaning the 81-centimeter distance that you're allowed. Notice also the bar pass. We're going to talk about that in a moment. This here then kind of shows you, again, the heavier expert and the light expert, longer force application off the chest. The lighter and heavier lifters don't see so much of a dip in terms of their how much force has to be produced to hold it when it gets to the chest. So when, again, lowering it nice and controlled means I don't need this huge force spike at the beginning. And then, of course, the application and the length of force is considerably less, the length of force application in terms of time is considerably less in the novice lifter. So, the bar path then. Even with much greater loads, shoulder moments were not greater in advanced lifters. The modified movement must be made to avoid this. So, although we did talk about the, the greater moment in the taller lifters, we did find in the research suggested that once we started uh, loading up the weight, where you would think, God, the load of the weight alone is going to cause a much greater force away from the shoulder line. Pretty obvious, right? What we actually found is that that wasn't the case because then the advanced lifter modified the movement once again. Just like in the squat, how we took away the shear forces on the knee even though we lifted tremendously more weight, do the same thing in the bench press. We reduced all the torques about the various joints, taking less pressure off those joints, or, or reducing the pressure off those joints because we modified the lift uh, to, to do that. So I'm going to show you how that's done in a moment. And then, of course, the sequence of muscle group force production, uh, there's a sequence of how we do this. There's actually this on-off work that probably helps us do these things better. And, of course, uh, sticking point is a, role, uh, is, a, is, a, you know, is a definite, and the grip may play a role. So, and I'll show you some grip work in a moment. So here, just quickly, again, illustrates the competitive uh, lifter here. Look at the arc. Hmm, that's opposite to what every uh, uh, general book tells you to do, right? The general books tell you to do the arc this way. The general books will tell you to arc that way around. In actual fact, it's probably better to arc this way around. And the reason what we find and why that happens is an advanced lifter actually utilizes his or her lats in the first push-off of the bar at the chest. That makes sense because the lats and the pecs are both, for those of you that are, know your anatomy, are arm adductors. If I can get my initial motion to get the lats involved too, wow, the lats is a huge muscle group. They got to be able to contribute to a lot of force, right? So let me get them involved in the lift as well. So my first movement then becomes this, in a sense, and of course it doesn't quite happen that way, but if my first movement is attempted to be that, now all of a sudden that kind of movement is going to help produce a huge amount of force. That type of movement though is actually going to alter the bar path to go backwards first and then go up as our body position comes into play. That's a teaching t tidbit right there. Hey, guess what? When I'm down there on the bench and I've got the bar sitting on my chest, try to forcefully drive my elbows in, and it's not going to quite happen like that. When I talk about this, it's not like I actually do this when I bench press huge weight. But the actual effort of trying to do this is probably going to help accelerate the bar much greater because I've got way more muscle mass working in there. And the, and the other thing about it is now I get opposing muscles working together rather than working against each other. Because in all exercises, if I'm doing like a bicep curl, if my triceps are working against it, well, there's going to be no movement. So now what I've done is figured out an, a better way to make this movement occur. And of course, a lot of this stuff happens naturally. When I say I figured out a better way, I mean it figuratively. Power lifters have come a, a, with a better way to do the lift by taking advantage of the mechanical things that exist. So I think that's a pretty nifty uh, piece of information right there. And then this just shows you, now this is what happens at a 100% load. This is what happens at an 80% load. Notice at an 80% load, straight line, piece of cake, nobody has a problem. Now it's light. 80% for uh, a person doing a single repetition, piece of cake. So boom, I just press it right to the top. Look at how perfect that straight line activity is on a, uh, 
on a competitive lifter, and it's not too bad even on an amateur uh, lifter. But here, now you can really see. Amateur lifter probably was reading some of those magazines out there, and I won't uh, name any magazines because I write for a few of them. Um, but, you know, doing that arc going the opposite way than uh, what we're suggesting might be a better way to do it. So, our net then becomes uh, the more linear bar path is actually recommended. Expert bench pressers, modified bar path and body position so that the muscles involved were able to work more effectively throughout the movement. Again, we come up with a better way to do this thing, makes it much easier to produce the kind of force that we want. Uh, interesting thing was the EMG data, that's when you stick muscle electrodes to, uh, to your body parts and, and figure out uh, the firing rates of the muscles. Pecs uh, were continuous throughout the entire movement. So the whole movement showed pectoralis work. The problem occurred in the, in the triceps and the deltoids. So most of our failures that we find occur in the triceps and the deltoids when we do this bench press. Why? Well, first of all, they're not as anywhere near as effective in terms of their force production as something like the pecs. Second of all, as we start getting longer through the range of motion, we're taking out the other muscles that were helping at the beginning. And so now what we're doing is forcing this small deltoid to brunt the large share of this horizontal adduction that occurs. Deltoid's not a very big, the, the anterior deltoid's not a real big muscle in comparison to the pecs and so forth. The other problem is, is our mechanics of trying to get those three to work together, that doesn't work too well. It's not really easy to get those guys working, because remember, muscles pull, they do not push. And so muscles pull in different ways. Triceps wants to pull this open, while pecs wants to pull this across, and there's going to be competition against those two to do that. Because to pull this across is much easier than to pull it across when it's straight. You all try that, you know, you're all done pec deck. It's much easier to do your pec deck like this than it is to do your pec deck like that. So again, I get into a mechanical problem. I get my pecs competing with my triceps rather than working together with them, and that's probably again where the sticking point occurs. So that transition between pec dominant lifting and tricep dominant lifting is again probably where the sticking point occurs. There's no way around that. I can't modify unless I go to you know, one of these physicians here and have them you know, reattach my muscles in a different configuration. So here's the bar pass then. Actually, that's a, a descent to ascent. Here's a, a little bit better picture to look at. Here's the bar path of our 100% lift. So that's 100% of your maximum. This is 80% of your maximum. We saw that already. We noticed that there's a change in the mechanics. This, of course, is probably where the sticking region is going to occur. What happens is now all of a sudden my displacement becomes uh, more horizontal, less vertical, and that's because the velocity starts slowing down and the leverage uh, segments uh, change. And then again, I get my force back up to continue the production. So this is kind of neat. We notice that as you lift more weight, you're going to have to modify the movement. Light enough weight, I explode right through. I have no bar path problems. And all your clients are going to be like that. And that then tells me that progression is very necessary too. Because if I don't teach you this proper way of doing the bench press, and I just go and throw on a whole pile of weight, it's going to be pretty ugly because you're never going to build the mechanics the right way. But if I slowly progress you, and uh, you know, much like a power lifter does as they get ready for competition, we don't just go from doing you know, eight rep uh, workouts to you know, going in and doing a one rep max. There's no way. There's too much change between what I do for eight reps over what I do for one repetition. So the same mentality needs to be taken when I prescribe an exercise. Okay, so. This just kind of uh, suggests everything I talked about. I know it's like a really busy slide. Um, bar moves in the nonlinear fashion. We spoke about that. There's a disadvantageous moment arm at that particular point, which decreased the force potential. So we, we took a look at that. The sticking point is characterized by a slight change in the arc of the bar movement. Experienced lifters may intentionally do this to compensate for the sticking point. Notice how I got may. We don't necessarily know that that's the truth. We're just kind of assuming that. And again, with most research that we look at, uh, anyone who tells you definitely uh, probably doesn't have a, a real good idea of what's going on. There are no definites in the ball game. If there were, we wouldn't still be doing this research. There'd be no need. It's like with why you guys are here for training. If we knew the right way to train, every one of us would be out of business. Be one book, one way to do it, one person teaching it, that's it, it's all over, done, no more help is needed. So again, when you're looking at these things, we're always kind of just giving that may, may. And if you read a journal article, almost every single one of them will say at the very end, 
Further research is needed in this area. And uh, so we suggest that, for sure. Um, it's been generally accepted, although not proven, that a lifter will intentionally try to accelerate the bar through the sticking region. Again, if I give you anecdotal evidence by talking to the power lifters in this room, every one of them will probably tell you, hey, the first thing I do is drive right off the chest. I drive out of the hole. Although we can't just take that and you know, publish that for, uh, from the research perspective, that's probably what happens. And that's why I think the term powerlifting may be not so bad, even though it might have started out uh, as a term where we say, well, powerlifting, the bar doesn't move too fast. The bar does not move too fast, but I can guarantee you powerlifters are among the fastest folks out there, too. If you take a powerlifter and stick them out there in that first five yards of a 40-yard dash, that first uh, you know, few uh, uh, feet of doing anything, and they're going to blow the doors off of most people because intuitively we have to explode the bar. And that goes in line with some research done by some folks here in McMaster University, uh, uh, Beam and Sale. Hope I didn't butcher that. Um, they've done a lot of work in the neurological efficiency, and they've got an article, and anybody who wants, I, I don't know if I put it in my article list, but they had a great article about intended velocity, uh, the attempt to produce a very fast movement may be enough to satisfy that condition to make you more powerful. So lifting heavy still may work well. And remember, lifting heavy means moving the bar slow. Moving the bar slow does not mean that we're going to produce a huge amount of power. So there is a, there is a little bit of uh, you know, controversy there. But I can tell you this, the general idea which we use probably suggests that a huge amount of power has to be uh, exerted. And then they say, well, why doesn't a power lifter are able to you know, uh, power clean? If they've got so much power, how come they can't power clean? Well, two reasons why. One, their muscle mass is probably too big to get their arms in the right kind of position. But secondly, their application of force is going to be entirely different. And of course, if you don't practice it, you can't do anything real well. Anybody try to get up there and, anybody try to get up there and, you know, and, and snatch weight and stick it over your head like that? It's not too easy. You take a novice, you take an expert power lifter who is a novice Olympic lifter, and it's just not going to happen. Question all the way to back there. Um, I don't know if it's applicable at this point, but what effect does an, uh, an excessive arch at the beginning of the bench do to affect most of what you just What effect does an excessive body arch? Oh, well, body arch is a fabulous thing to do. may not be the thing that your athletes need, but it's a fabulous thing to do because the first thing it does is shortens the distance I've got to push. The second thing, and some people have humongous arches, the second thing is I'd probably minimize that, that uh, disadvantageous sticking point position because I may be able to get up enough of an arch to get somewhat past it. Now, having done that, though, when I do arch, I still put a sticking point in because now I've altered the mechanics, the regular mechanics of my shoulder, so I create another sticking point that exists somewhere in between, but it's probably much less sticking point. And of course, so the arch also seems to get the bar shoulder line much more into it with each other. And I can't you know, demonstrate very well from here, but if you take a look, as I arch up in this kind of position, what happens is when the bar comes down, I've now got the bar closer this way to the shoulder. This distance uh, between here and here is now closer to the shoulder. So I've reduced the moment about the shoulder. And when I've done that, I've now produced greater force in line to travel up. So an arch is going to be very effective in increasing your maximal bench press. Again, is that good for uh, you know, my client who's just trying to get a little more strength? I don't know. And is it going to be good for isolating musculature? I don't know. Uh, you know would I recommend it for a bodybuilder trying to produce massive chest uh, you know, pectoralis uh, gains? I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you the answer. Question, yeah. Yes, would you, would you recommend that for, like, to say I was training an athlete to say, get more load and build on strength training, period. Do you recommend using an arch for the bench press or this flat? I would recommend a slight arch, a sort of a, what I call the modified arch, in that you want to get your shoulder blades back and you want to get into a nice position, but I don't recommend doing a huge arch because, again, it's not going to probably favor that sport-specific environment in the long run. Um, you know, I'd have to take a look at the sport and see what happens. But if, for example, with my football players and baseball players, I would just have them, you know, contract their shoulder blades together so that their chest would pop up slightly and they'd get themselves in a little bit better alignment. But I wouldn't have them do the excessive powerlifting arch that I, you know, did when I competed. This shows you what happens when it fails. Typically, a failed attempt, this was a, what I thought was very interesting, is a failed attempt starts off bad in a lot of cases. Because the weight's heavy and I'm having trouble managing it, 
I'm even further away from the origin of the shoulder. So that, that, that probably plays some of the role too. Now, again, I can't say that this was truly, truly competitive lifters because my, my guess would be if you, you know, I, I competed for, for quite a long time. I lifted for uh, several years and um, I would venture to guess that my touch point is probably pretty much the same. Um, however, what happens is when you go to do that drive, you just don't have the power or the force to do it. And so your natural motion is just kind of coming across. That just kind of illustrates this is the, po the, the failure point. Hey, look where the failure point occurred, right? The sticking region. And that's why everybody fails there. Now, everybody's sticking region is different. Mine may be closer to the chest than yours. But everybody, when they fail their attempt, they always fail. Oh, it just failed just off the chest. I would have had it. Or I failed just some, oh, and I would have had it. And you're, you're, you're failing here, guaranteed. You didn't produce enough acceleration in the right direction all together, keeping that line to get through the sticking point. Bottom line. And this is on any lift. Uh, so here's some interesting stuff. The pause. This to me is just blows me away when I look at research and, and see. Because for me, anybody who does not pause at the chest on the bench press is not doing a bench press. Now I'm not suggesting you have to do the competition length of a pause. But any of all those out there doing the CPR bench press, well, that's the... <laughs> That kind of thing, uh, you're not taking it, you know, that, that to me is not a, a real good bench press. Now, having said that, this I think is just amazing that we know, and this is just like the science behind it, 35% force reduction in a short pause bench press as compared to a rebound bench press and even greater reduction in a long pause bench press. So that means if I take just a momentary pause on my chest as compared to rebounding it, I've lost about 35% force production. Now think about that in terms of those 1RM lifts. That is huge. As you continue on, 14.5% greater load to be used for the rebound bench press as compared with the purely concentric bench press. So the amount of weight I can initially lift is considerably le less when I impose that pause. And then this, I think, is even the most, uh, you know, the really most interesting thing. Let me get out of your way so you can see. A pause duration of 0.35 seconds, 0.35 seconds, 3 tenths of a second, cause about a 25% decay in the prior stretch augmentation, and that of a 0.9 second delay would cause a 52% decay in stretch augmentation. Remember we talked about the pre-stretch? Remember the charts I showed you up there of how valuable that pre-stretch was? I give you a, ten, a one second delay on the bench press, and I've taken about half of your strength away that you gain from that elastic stretch response. And if you don't think that's important, here's an easy way to think about it. Stand up straight and try to jump without bending your knees and doing this first. I can bet most of you aren't getting your toes off the ground. So without the stretch response, I'm screwed when it comes to force uh, development. So in the purely concentric bench press, or in the style that's elicited by a power lifter, what we have to do are force to produce a huge amount of force because we don't gain the stretch augmentation. So now that question goes back is, do I do the rebound bench press or do I do the pause bench press in training? What's going to be better for my athletes? When I do the pause, I'm killing myself. But by killing myself, maybe I'm forcing more recruitment of my muscle fibers to do the work anyways, right? Maybe I'm suggesting that when I hold a pause, I need some help here. Get the lats involved in the bench press. Get my body involved in the bench press. And that may help to produce some of the force. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Still no answers yet as to what we're going to do, but I thought that was pretty impressive. This just kind of shows you then. Now, you've got to kind of understand what happens. This is power. There's about 150, uh, 200 Newton difference a watt difference in power when I do a, a rebound bench press versus a purely concentric bench press. That's a large amount, remember. Okay, that's a huge amount. That's almost, that's just a little less than half difference between the rebound and the purely concentric bench press in terms of the power output. And this is kind of interesting. Look at the rate of force production. When I pause it on my chest, it takes me a lot longer to build up that force production than I do when I rebound. Okay. Think about our plyometric situation. I'll come back to that in one moment. Here's the force difference. Wow. I mean, look at that. Twice as much force produced when I do a uh, rebound bench press versus when I hold it on my chest uh, or start from the chest bottom position. Remember we talked about that with the deadlift too, and we're going to see that very shortly with the deadlift data. Man, not getting taken advantage of that stretch, that's going to be a huge difference. So that's something we really need to consider in training. Now, the question then is, is maybe if I do concentric bench presses or short pause bench presses, maybe I can force the musculature to get a better drive initially. 
And maybe by doing that, that will allow me to get more force overall. Again, these are big maybes, because I don't know. I mean, it's the best way to, to do pause uh, reps uh, in your training. By powerlifter standards, we almost have to, because, of course, we've got to pause it when we get to competition. That doesn't mean it's the best thing to do, though. Uh, so a, a group uh, back in 92 found that uh, th this was the uh, optimal distance for grip. And this was kind of neat. They found that somewhere between uh, about 200% of your biacromial distance, means from your acromion process to the other acromion process, about 200% of this distance, so again, this distance out, is supposedly about the best place to produce the maximum amount of force. Now, having said that, you're all saying, whoa, God, your hands are out there pretty wide. They are. And that does put an extra stress on the shoulder, you bet. We're talking about producing maximal force in a straight line, not necessarily how much shoulder uh, possibility hurts. Now, if you have bad shoulders, this ain't going to work for you very well. So it's all relative when we look at this thing. So grip uh, width is inversely related to the uh, amount of shoulder moment. Of course, uh, it does produce moment in the other direction. This moment direction here is going to be considerably less because when I get wider, I've now got the bar better over top of my shoulder and better over top of the line of action than I do when I've got a narrower grip because I have to touch down here. But having said that, this position now puts the shoulder in a vulnerable uh, other position. So there's always going to be a trade-off. And this just kind of shows you the optimal grip distance appears to be this one in the middle because of the distance it is from the shoulder and the amount of uh, uh, distance I have to push and so forth. This just kind of gives you a quick illustration about the different grips. Then the next chart just shows you, hey, guess what? Our peak power was produced at somewhere around, or peak strength was produced at somewhere around 200% of your grip width. Okay? Does that mean everybody needs to go out now and start benching wide grip? The answer is no. And nor do I recommend going out there and just jumping to that way without slowly getting yourself to the right position. But if you want to increase your bench press, your bench press number, you're going to have to move your grip to a wider position to take advantage of the mechanics that are associated with it. Again, how important is that against the possibility of injury and uh, with the things that your client are trying to do, that's where you guys have to make those decisions. So we want to try to minimize the uh, uh, arc, okay? So we want to try to develop as close as we can to a straight uh, line. Explode the bar off the chest to ride through the sticking point. Uh, remember, the CPR bench press compressions are not recommended. So that means I want to get this explosive power, but not because of this boom, boom, rebound to get it. The other thing that's really important is when we think about that is timing is essential when you do a rebound. And if you don't have really good timing mechanics, it's really hard to drop a weight, slow it down, stop it, and start it back up in the opposite direction. So the need to slow the bar down and control it is, is vital in all the lifts. Uh, so we're trying to get to a 90-90 position. 90 armpit, 90 elbow when the bar is at the chest. That actually seems to work out to about 200% of your biochromial distance. That also allows maximal help from the lats, from the pecs, allows me to get the initial drive real good. Again, that is at a sacrifice of possible other things that exist. So that's where you, as the strength coach, have to make your uh, decisions. Um, we know that the grip uh, selection may be a factor then. And here's just another little tidbit. And unfortunately, I don't really have much data other than some stuff I did when I was uh, uh, doing my undergraduate thesis. So I didn't really want to kind of bring that out because it's not published or anything. Uh, but we found that there's a huge amount of force in the legs. What I did is actually put force plates under the feet when we benched and looked at a competitive bench pressers versus uh, just uh, general folks who bench press, and there was a huge difference relative to the amount of weight lifted in the uh, competitive bench presser using their feet uh, quite a bit. So it would played a very big role in the amount of force that was uh, pressed in by the feet, which suggests that that helps balance your body and contribute to overall bar force. Now, as far as the deadlift goes, really there is so little information. That's why I got plenty of time to tell you in about 15 minutes, uh, because I don't have anywhere near the information that I found in the bench press. In fact, I only found five articles relating to the deadlift at all. And from those articles, uh, and I know there's one or two out there. I mean, I, I probably don't have all the literature that exists, but I, but I can guarantee you, and your list here will probably have about 80% of all literature. I have about 98% of all literature. There's like just nothing on the deadlift. Which means anybody who's interested in doing deadlift work, I'll be more than happy to do some collaboration with you in our labs 
uh, on some deadlifting because uh, I think there's a lot of neat things that are, exist in there and I can't wait to get to that uh, as well. Body segment orientation, vertical bar acceleration, this is the same kind of stuff as every single thing. Now what we have, though, is a moment arm with respect to the center of mass of the body. As far, the farther you get a bar away from your body as you're trying to lift it up, the worse that becomes on the, the muscles that are involved in it. The greater the forces are on your hips, your back, and all those other musculature, also the more the weight feels like. And those of you who know your physics, just do the math. You take your perpendicular distance from your line of action, and now you've got that extra moment out there, you can pretty much quickly decide how much that really means. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with NIOSH and OSHA. Those are the guys that set up the occupational lifting loads that someone's allowed to lift. And if you look at it, it's somewhere no, uh, someone should never lift more than something like 20 pounds in a work environment. Because that, when you have to lift 20 pounds and put it on another shelf, this moment arm puts too much pressure on the back, according to NIOSH and OSHA. Well, think about that as we now got an 800-pound deadlifter. You get an 800-pound deadlift one inch away from your intended line of action, and oh my God, are we talking about some forces there. But the funny thing is, is you know, powerlifters, you're not seeing powerlifters blowing out their backs when they're doing it. Again, their conditioning level and their training leads them up to it. So no matter how we do things, we just need to get somebody trained properly. So that just shows you how we do it. Pretty crazy stuff. I don't even know what all that means. I just stuck it on there because it looked like it made me look like I knew what I was talking about. So, um, Brown Nabani did uh, most of the work, and then this Escamilla and his group did some of the latest work recently. And I'm, I'm kind of want to look more into it and give those guys a call. Um, the early portion of the lift is knee dominant, greater range of motion in unskilled lifters uh, in the ankle, knee, and thigh. So what we're finding is that when you look at the uh, lift, and they actually compared, uh, not these guys, but uh, compared, there's a comparison between the sumo and traditional styles, I'll show you that in a moment, um, found that they're more knee dominant. Now the interesting thing is, is that when you get to the sumo style squat, uh, be, uh, deadlift, now what happens is you turn it more into a squat, more, you know, somewhat into a squat, and you actually get some activation from the old hamstrings now helping you in this lift. So, and I don't know if, if for the reasons of why this occurs, I, I would just generally guess that the taller lifters appear to do the traditional style while a lot of the shorter lifters are now doing the sumo style. And probably that again has to do with the lever mechanics that are going to be associated with it. That again would be a really interesting study to see. Uh, max vertical bar acceleration occurs about 0.4 seconds into the lift. Hey, that's kind of neat. Not at the beginning. And those of you who deadlift know you can't just jerk the bar off the ground. We find the same thing actually in the Olympic lifts as well. Although the Olympic lifters are way more explosive, guaranteed, none of them just snap it off the ground. If you look at the data, it just kind of shows there's a, it's just a much sharper curve, but you'll see their curve, I'll show you in a minute. Their curve, instead of doing this also, their curve is going to do a little bit of this and then a big that, whereas a deadlifter is just going to have a more uniform curve going up, meaning that you can't just snap the weight up without controlling it first and getting the bar started. Why is that? We got no pre-stretch. We can't just tell a muscle, hey, contract as hard as you can and not give them a chance to develop any force in there from the pre-stretch. So by nature, when I do teach somebody how to power clean or deadlift or any of these lifts, what do I tell them to do? Start the bar off slowly, then get the hips driving hard into it. Um, so we find out a few of these interesting things. And again, this graph is way too complicated to take a look at. Um, so I'll just give you the, the digested version of it all. And the digested version is that traditional method employs more ankle plantar flexor, knee flexor, and hip extensor. So that's interesting. The traditional close leg shows us more, more plantar flexor activity, which is that uh, gastroc doing the, uh, doing the plantar flexion. Why is that? Well, when you get your feet out wide and you start taking advantage of the hamstring use, the hamstrings and the gastrocs both work on the knee in terms of uh, uh, for flexion and when we're trying to extend if we don't want the gastrox to work too hard because then I'm going to cause too much activation from the quads doing not helping me in the extension portion. So I get the hamstrings now activated in the lift when I go to a sumo style. Hamstrings and hip extensors, your butt, those are going to help out quite a bit. Yeah? When you say traditional, are you talking about stiff leg? No, I'm talking about just a standard um, hand, you know, reversed hand, 
deadlift in this body position here where my legs are closer together like that. I'll call that traditional and then sumo being the, the wide stance position that you'll see. Yeah, the stiff leg deadlift information, there's some stuff on that. I didn't throw that in because uh, you know, we're talking more about the power lifts, but I can, you know, we can talk about that after if you, if you want some uh, information on it. So the sumo position was more upright. Uh, sumo sh uh, shows greater control of uh, ankle dorsiflexion. And then, so that, again, it's just a change in musculature that's being used. Uh, there's a greater bar displacement in traditional. And that has to do with the fact that when you're in a traditional method, you start out with your knees slightly over the bar. You're going to have to somewhat pull the bar around your knees. In the sumo style, if you spit, uh, get your knees wide enough out, now the fact is that the knees are going to come up. You're not going to have to clear around your knees. It's going to come up right past it. So I take some of the moment off. Again, whether that means everybody should be sumo styling or not, I don't know. Because how many sports do you see are played like this? Very few. I'm not going to get my football player in this position. So I'm not so sure I'm now going to have football players or uh, you know, whoever it is, volleyball players, doing sumo style squats. But the research is indicating that that might be a better way to lift the weight overall. Again, I'm not going to tell uh, you know, uh, Gary Heisey and all those guys that did all those massive uh, deadlifts back then that they're not, they didn't do it the right way because you know, how do you argue a 900 pound traditional uh, style deadlift? Um, so we find that kind of information is pretty interesting. And again, guess what? Two peaks. Pretty neat. Now, the neat thing is in the deadlift, and this was a, a traditional style, the neat thing is in the deadlift is you don't get the same hip activity as you do as the knee activity. Again, in the traditional deadlift, the bar is not in position to get, take advantage of hip work. And as you notice, also in the deadlift, because there's no pre-stretch, this rate of force development and this length of time where I've got this force development is going to be much greater than you'll see in the squat and the bench press where I can get that initial huge drive. There's only so much of a drive I'm going to get in a deadlift when I start in the concentric position. So there is a huge amount, again, back to that eccentric loading. Here's an a, a Olympic lift. I, I, I borrowed some information from uh, Anoka's group back in 79 showing the, uh, the difference between the power clean. Now look at the pronunciation of this uh, uh, curve. Again, huge explosive activity. And if you look, these are in tenths of a second. Two tenths of a second to maximum explosion. And again, like I said, it starts out slightly that way before it then, boom, takes this start, uh, sharp gain upwards for acceleration. So once I get that bar off the ground and moving, bam, I just accelerate huge into it. And this is a huge amount of acceleration that you get in an Olympic lift. And again, that's what tells coaches, hey, we should be doing the power cleans and the explosive lifts because you develop so much more power. So certainly off the ground, we develop so much power. The neat thing I like about this study, uh, this portion, is they only looked at the first pull, which doesn't have the catch portion. Hey, guess what? That's great. I think that's exactly what we need to be working on with, with our athletes, that first pull. Now the problem is, what do I do with the weight? And uh, so that's been to be the question. Explosive lifts work good if I've got somewhere to put the weight. And I'm actually leading to something which I may or may not be able to show you guys, those of you who want to stay, because I know we're not. Mel, are you following me right away or not until 1, right? Okay. Well, because I got a little small piece of video that if anybody wants to stick around, I'll stick it up for a second. Um, I'm almost done anyways. So Escamillo's group then found that, uh, you know, the interesting thing was is there was really no difference in some of the back extensor muscles, regardless of which style we used, that a lot of the effect, again, had to be around the hip muscles and around the knee muscles, depending on which style we used. And we talked about knee-dominant traditional versus hip-dominant sumo, sumo style. Um, so those were the, where the differences uh, showed. Also, just an interesting thing was they threw a belt on and they compared some of the intra-abdominal pressures of using a belt versus not using a belt. And obviously, as we found, uh, you know, putting a belt on is going to contribute to the overall force output because it contributes to the uh, overall intra-abdominal pressure. That in itself is a whole big area of study, which is kind of neat. And there is some research out there. So anybody who's interested in that belt or not belt kind of thing, uh, I'd be more than happy to work with you on it. And then, of course, if I can get some sponsors and some people to help, or just some people to help, really not sponsors, um, I'll be more than happy to take a look at bench shirts and squat suits and leg wraps and all those kind of things, because those will be kind of fun to, to see what's going on. I think there's some neat stuff out there. Hey, this just kind of shows you vastus lateralis is the dark one. The, um, 
the lateral gastroc is the light one, is the diamond one, and this is your uh, hamstring. In the uh, traditional style lifts, as you see when the knee is extending, not too much hamstring work, okay, huge amount of uh, knee extensor work. And then, of course, uh, even the thing I thought was really interesting was that the gastrox uh, produced some pretty decent strength as well, traditional style. In the sumo style, unfortunately, they don't, have the, they don't show you the sumo style. If you, looked, if you would look at the sumo style information, you would see this hamstring line would probably be up above the, the gastroc line uh, in, you know, in the way it works out. This shows you some other muscles that are involved. So, like I said, unfortunately, deadlifting research isn't too great. So to sum summarize the deadlifting, and then I got a couple of just total summary slides, keep bar close to the body. Use a stance that's more closely related to the sport requirements. Else, the sumo style is probably less stressful on the joints, probably contributes to overall force. However, if sumo style is not sport specific for you, that's not something I'm recommending you to, uh, to get your athletes doing. As far as the deadlift stance may be chosen on a basis of squat stance. If you got a wide squat, Hey, doing a sumo style deadlift may, of course, work in conjunction with you. Uh, so that might be something that may, uh, may be of interest. And then greater hip drive initially will help carry the bar through the sticking point. Well, we know that from all the other stuff that we've seen. And remember then, the sumo style allows us to get greater hip drive. So that's how we think we might be able to get more force production from them. So the summary of my whole presentation then, and I appreciate all your patience, Failed attempts are a combination of poor mechanical force production position and uh, uh, also in concert with a decline in strain energy built up during the eccentric phase. So I don't get a good uh, drop down in the eccentric phase and I'm not going to be able to contribute too much to the overall force production, which means controlled descent, very important in all my lifts. Relative shifts within the bimodal curve as seen between fast and slow squatting may suggest that it's possible to accelerate the bar through the sticking region as the speed decreases and or the load increases, the ability to overcome this sticking region appears to decrease, yada, yada, yada. Which simply means, again, accelerate and drive out of the hole, and there's a good chance I can get myself through the sticking region. Having said that, it's a controlled acceleration. And you can't get a controlled acceleration if you have an uncontrolled eccentric movement. And that's what I see all the people in the gym trying to do. Guys, we suck when we go to the gym. We want to just lift all this massive amount of weight and don't care about our technique. You drop the bar down too quickly to try to get a rebound effect from it, and it's not going to help you. You drop too fast, you're not going to stop it and turn the bar around. It's just not going to happen. So the controlled descent is going to make a huge difference. If you've ever been to a powerlifting competition, you don't see those guys because they got 900 pounds dropping fast to the ground. Are you kidding me? It's never going to happen. It's a nice controlled descent, and then boom. That's the same thing with the bench press. And I see this in the gym. The lower down, then try at the very end to do this, to catch it at the bottom. Like, you can't do that. As soon as you increase your deceleration rate, which is actually what we call uh, the jerk, measured by the jerk, as soon as you increase that to a point that your body can't overcome it, you kill yourself. You're not going to be able to turn the power back around. So it always has to be a, a nice uh, controlled descent. As far as fatigue, we, we showed the fatigue very briefly. And of course, I, again, I don't have it published data. but uh, plays a role in the body position as well as the angle-specific force production. As a, if those of you who stick around, I'll show you the quick video. You'll see I was just uh, fooling around in our lab, and as I started to fatigue, you could just see my back doing one of these things. And, and I won't even tell you how much I'm lifting because it make me embarrass me because I was fatiguing. Um, it's called age and all that other kind of thing. Um, but yeah, guess what? That's going to make a difference when designing a program. Prior training experience will have an effect on the force output and the degree to which the sticking region is felt. The sticking region will exist, but can be trained. However, my suggestion is here is not to just train the sticking region. Now, I hear about that, and I know there are groups out there that practice that, and I'm not telling you anybody's wrong or otherwise. But trying to just train an area in here without matching it up to what you need to develop off of here is going to be very, very difficult to do. Because the key is where I accelerate here, not what happens here. So if I can't get this timed with this, it's not going to matter. And that's why I keep going back to saying, hey, what we need to do is come up with this. And I don't know a good way to do that. Maybe an isometric chest press at the bottom here. I'm not sure. But that's what we probably have to tra uh, change. Because no matter what, that, force, uh, that uh, sticking point exists, no matter what you do. Yeah? Would some of that data suggest that the sticking point is not worth the bar, is stopping or 
eventually slowing down, but the muscle groups before that. Sorry? And the, the data suggests that your sticking point is really not where the bar stops, or as it starts to slow down, those muscle groups there, but the muscle groups before them because it, you're deaccelerating yeah. faster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What happens is, what is, is what's happening is before the sticking point, and the guys that are involved in doing that portion, not what's happening at the sticking point. And that's where the terminology seems to be lost in everybody telling me, how do I get to the sticking point? You can train the sticking point region, or you can train what's happening before, because the before is where all the activity is really occurring. The simple fact is we see, and you saw it in the fast, in the fast explosive lifts, I didn't even have much of a second force curve at all. That second curve was, was non-existent when I was able to explode it. Suggestive of the fact that if I can explode really hard, doesn't, it's not going to really matter. And so, yeah, absolutely right. We need to be training in that area and looking at the musculature that's involved in that. Hey, guess what? Get your lats involved in your bench press, and I can promise you, you're going to get more help in the bench press. Doesn't mean everybody's going to be benching five, six, seven hundred pounds. Everybody claims they do, but you know, not everybody's going to be doing that. But certainly, you can increase your bench by, uh, by, a, by a chunk of weight. Lastly, then, pre-stretching has clear benefits in force production, as does rebounding for the minimum sticking uh, region difficulty. So. Pre-stretching and rebounding does seem to reduce some of the, uh, the, the problems that have. But however, a controlled descent followed by an explosive ascent appears to modify the bar path and minimize the effect of the leverage disadvantage. Those two coupled together says, hey, guess what? Explosive and momentum should not be confused. Lowering the bar fast, trying to take advantage of momentum, trying to use the compressive nature of the fact that I've got muscle and fat here that, that just generally bounces off of itself, trying to use that factor in the bench press is not going to help. Same with the squat. When I stretch the heck out of a set of muscles, they're going to snap back, but not if I stretch them too fast or too great. So it's got to be a controlled thing. So that's the sort of the take-home message uh, there. And then if you just kind of see, you'll see I've got pages and pages and pages of research that exists out there, as well as tons more information for you. So. Uh, in conclusion, then, I thank you all for kind of hanging out. Those of you who want to stay, I'm just going to move right to the, little, to the video. Those who have questions, I'll be here, uh, I'll be here all weekend uh, long. Just look for me. You'll be able to find me and uh, have more, no, no problem sitting down with you. As well, if you have specific questions, you want me to email you about training techniques themselves uh, and or more research, that would be cool. Just send it off to that email address. So thank you. We'd like to thank David Sandler for this excellent presentation and also to present him the Swiss Eagle for help wow. us, helping us out here. Thank you very much, David. Ooh. Wow. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. Well, Dana, you can see. And notice how fatigue starts setting in. It wasn't too light. It was just uh, lighter than the, the heavy weight lift for me. And then if you notice the very heavy weight, relatively speaking, of course. Look at the bar position. Comes back, see the sticking point there? Everybody, I don't know if you guys can catch that because I, I can't slow it down, unfortunately. But it's, it's really uh, amazing to me when I look at this and say, hey, I look like, like that data suggests. If you take a look about, I don't know, about a few inches off the chest, I drive it up and then I make that backward shift and then pull it back up over my head. So again, that, ar that arcing path goes the opposite way than uh, is suggested. So that's one of the things we do to, do this, uh, to look at these things. Then as far as with our squats, for example, so here's some squats uh, and some deadlifting work. So now we are just doing some squats in the lab. And uh, you can see the ProSpot device, uh, the way that's working. Now, we normally have the cameras. What I do is face two cameras at you, and you can't see from the position. There it is, just hang the weight, the way you go. So what I've got is, what I'll have on my body, and I don't have them on here because I didn't really want to get that industrious, but I'll put hip markers. We'll have the guy squat in either a suit, uh, you know, a suit, uh, just a standard uh, wrestling suit, or naked, or, you know, with a pair of underwear on or something like that. Put a marker on the ankle, marker on the knee, marker on the hip, marker on the bar, and we'll examine the lifts in terms of the movement. And then we can just see how much force is produced. And you notice the straight line. Here's the very interesting thing. This is one of my graduate assistants. He's six foot four, and I think uh, not, a, not a huge lifter, but watch how straight the bar goes up and down. So even a guy that traditionally would have very poor mechanics does an excellent job. Why? Because he learned how to squat. 
And if you look at the barbell, go straight up and down. I think this was, this was very impressive when I saw him squatting, saying, hey, look at that. The guy's got great control of the bar for, a, for someone who's six foot four. I worked with a lot of basketball players and a lot of tall football players that could not squat properly. So mechanics uh, can really help that uh, out if you, uh, if you get them uh, doing the things the right way. Then we did a little deadlifting, and that's kind of neat. That's, uh, you know, there's our, just our little straight leg deadlift. This is one of my other GAs. He's a little light guy. You'll see him from the front side. Another thing I like about this machine is you can just kind of let it hang and reposition and do whatever you want. Uh, then you got me starting to fatigue because we were, we were screwing around before I got the rest of the video on there, and I do a sumo style. So you're going to see me fatiguing and watch my back start to curve and my form get real bad. Uh, you'll see. See that? Oh, that's terrible. Just start out with the hips and just... You know, just terrible right there. Um, it's then I quit because <laughs> it's easy. It's easy to quit. Then we show you around a front picture. Now he does power cleans. Uh, I don't like doing them because I'm not good at them. So you can see his body position for a power clean. Actually, his feet are a little bit wider than they probably would be normally apart. Anyway, what we do is we put a camera facing straight on and a camera facing on the side, and we merge the two data points by telling the two cameras where they are with relation to one another. And then we can calculate all the forces and velocity of the bar, the knee, the ankle, the hip. And what we think is probably going to be the key is figuring out the interaction between knee and hip and ankle and bar and so forth in something like a deadlift and a squat and in a bench press to be able to figure out where the best angle is for producing force depending upon the, uh, the sport that you do. So this is kind of uh, neat. Now, I hope I brought the one other thing I want to look I want to show you that this machine is so cool at doing. So if you can hang on one more second. So that just shows you another, you know, little batch of deadlifts. All right, one more thing. This is what we're now doing in our lab, which I think is really cool, is we're experimenting with, watch me try to do a very fast lift. Look at what happens. I get pulled off the bench when I develop enough speed. So what we're trying to do now is see what happens when I can actually release the bar. And you'll see it from the side a little better. And I've got the bar markers on. See the bar markers and an elbow marker. And, of course, I'll put a bunch of other markers on my body when I'm ready to do it. What we're doing is looking at the relative way to throw. Now, you see, this isn't too good, but now when I can release, which is the next shot, now I take all the joint forces off of trying to decelerate the bar to catch it. My big contention with the problem with power cleans is uh, the catch, whenever you try to catch an object, you've got to slow it down. And in fact, in most explosive lifts with a barbell, uh, 40 to 60% of the movement is, slow, is deceleration rather than acceleration. So now here what we do is we just we got a chance to see what happens. He's a little afraid of the thing coming back down on him. I, I know the machine won't. You'll see the relative rate when you lift a little heavier weight and then try to do an explosion with a heavier weight. Things don't work quite as good. I don't know if I actually let go of it or not. Can't remember what part I cut for you. I probably didn't even let go of it. No, nope, looks like I didn't. So anyway, you can kind of see the difference. And I think this device is really cool. So I'll let it run one more time and just kind of show you. When you release a bar, we believe that we can train now more superior by allowing this release activity in a safe environment. Because normally, you wouldn't throw a barbell up and try to catch it. Now I can throw it up because the machine will catch it. And I think that's a pretty nifty thing to be able to do. This company here, actually, this is not designed for what we use it for. Like I said, these guys sell to home users and to gyms, uh, to people who want to lift on their own. Of course, we our uh, scientists, we like to try some nifty things with it. So you can just see what happens when you throw the bar up. Now, from the side, the neat thing about this is this machine, I can calculate what happens this way, I can calculate what happens this way, and the rate at which these things are doing those things. And I think that might become very useful in training, because right now, those of you who are familiar with plyometrics and the things that we do in plyometrics, not very many great upper body plyometric exercises. Most of them are done with a... Uh, either explosive push-ups where I got to land or done with a med ball. Uh, and we don't have a lot of really good lower body uh, ways to, you know, lower body, it's easier to work with our body weight, but we don't have a lot of good resistance lower body ways to do it. Exploding up with a power clean where I have to catch it means I'm going to have a, a you know, a deceleration period. And I think that this might be sort of this, the new approach, the new way to go. So you should uh, look forward to seeing our research come out. And those of you have any you know, interest in this or questions about it or suggestions or want to get involved in the research, uh, regardless of whether you're you know, halfway across the country, the magic of computers help us do all this stuff, I'd be more than happy to talk with you. So thank you again for staying even longer.